Here we All go. right, folks. Hey, welcome. Welcome to On This Hill, Church in the Hills podcast with uh, Bruce and I. And I, we're back on the hill. We missed last uh, week, if you yep. uh, were looking for us. It was Easter week, mm-hmm. and around here, like most churches, Easter week is full of activity, and we yeah. were no different. There was lots going on, so yeah. put a hold on the podcast for, for a week, but we're back. Yeah, I was just asking you about the Easter hangover. Not not a literal <laughs> hangover, but yeah. the all the activities in the 40 days leading up to Easter. It does kind of leave you a little, that, that week after, a little, yeah. little shook. Yeah. You got to recover, wake up again. Yeah. yeah, it's a great um, it's a great week though. I think it's a week where everybody seems to slow down a little bit. And tries mm-hmm. to. And it's kind of funny how this year it landed on spring break. They the two landed together, which made it a little interesting. A lot of yeah. people were gone. And There's stuff. a little bit of competition there. Yeah, between I mean, which I totally get. There's people yeah. that hey, I have this week with my kids, right. especially once they get into high school and that spring break really means something because you start counting down like oh. I've got four spring breaks before my kids are gone. I've got three right. of it too. This is my last yeah. spring break before my kids are yeah. out of the house. You start realizing, oh, I've got to do something with these guys and yeah. make some memories. Oh. Yeah. Uh, they estimate, I, I was reading an article where something like two, two and a half billion people uh, went to church on oh. Easter weekend around the world, two and a half billion people. Mm-hmm. And that, I think that's a, it was on the low end, the con, you know, conservative estimate. I thought, what an interesting thing, you know, that even the news would carry something. Uh, I mean, what other event yeah. do two and a half billion people all participate in? Like, right. And so pretty, pretty, pretty significant. So. Yeah, I had some fun uh, in the last 40 days kind of looking at Easter traditions, resurrection traditions yeah. around the world and uh, how colorful so many of them are. Yeah. You know, it's, sometimes I feel like we can be a little bland. We can be a little vanilla, yeah. Yeah, the West. But Africa, yeah, oh, crazy. Yeah. South America, some yeah. of it's... Asia. Pretty extravagant, too. Yeah. The reenactment of... Uh, you know the the court scene, the reenactment of the cross. The Philippines does yep. this whole thing where they uh, they do it live. They literally mm-hmm. there's a guy who's been crucified uh, a dozen times over the last thirty yeah. or forty years. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> so <laughs> ours was tame. Yeah. If you were here, we were really tame compared to You're that. You're always threatening to bring animals onto the stage. <laughs> That's the thing with Bruce. If you don't know this. Like every every nativity, yeah. every he's always like, "What we need We're is a get camel." The camels, folks, <laughs> he's <laughs> donkeys. He's always threatening to bring a camel. That just and, cracks me up. I mean, it's just like, yeah, a camel in Almsville. <laughs> yeah, they exist. We they can do. get them. They're in the they're in the <laughs> neighborhood. Some guy out there. <laughs> yeah, would you ever really do it? I don't think so. The odds yeah. of that uh, of a mess are pretty. I think are pretty high. That's. Yeah, it's the only reason why I really want to do it is because it's memorable. It's right. kind of like having You'd kids never on the forget stage. It. Yeah. With kids on the stage, there's no controlling it. I mean, you can practice and practice, but then they get up there and some little boy's going to push some little girl or, you know, stick his tongue out at the audience. Or, right. Yeah. Yeah, those are great memories. Yeah. A camel spitting on somebody, however, is a not totally as Not as experience. great a memory, no. Yeah. Yeah, but this Easter, I there was uh, the testimonies. Man, I... I I was really blessed by them this year. I wasn't a part of the filming or anything, so I got to see them as soon as they were, yeah, you know, rough edited. Yeah. Ethan, who does this for us, did an amazing job at that. But uh, those four testimonies, I love the contrast between all of them. Yeah, they just kind of ping pong balled around mm-hmm. from one to the other. Matt, really our first one. If you were here, I guess you know what we're talking about. If you weren't, then you can you yeah, can find pick, it online. You can find it online, YouTube, or yeah, our but, web page. You know, Matt is an amazing guy with a testimony of, you know, coming from gang life and really murderous life. And so he he leads with I've stabbed 11 men by the time I was 14 and uh, you know, I mean he's just everyone's like, "Whoa." Yeah. And then Brenna the next one up is I memorized all the scriptures yeah. when I was a little and girl. I want us. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that like that's what the kingdom of God is made of. Yeah. Yeah. You know, all of those from, you know, addiction and recovery to little kids who don't remember a time they weren't in in church to, you know, people saved off the street, and we all come together into one giant family, and Resurrection Sunday shows, like, oh, this is what unites us all. Mm-hmm. As as uh, contrasting as those stories are, what they all have in common is I needed a Savior, and yeah. Jesus was my Savior. I needed a new life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I love the variety, uh, and we know those people. We don't just go find them, so to speak, out of nowhere. Those those are people that are among us, mm-hmm. part of our community. So we we've heard their stories, we've watched, we even watched their stories uh, 
Matt, I mean, you know, he's mm-hmm. well known in our in this community. Yeah, in, in the Salem, Greater Salem area. Yeah. And, uh, wasn't it Salem Heights that Salem Heights ministered yeah. to him first? Yeah, he, he was, was in youth. youth group way yeah. back in the day, but he had yeah. a super dysfunctional family. Yeah. And yeah, and he the, threatened. I, this is his story, but I don't think I'm telling any tales out of school because yeah. he shares this. He threatened to kill one of the youth leaders yeah. there. Yeah, or maybe yeah. some. He was of them. a wild child. Yeah, but <laughs> we were all child. to some degree. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's the beauty of the gospel, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. What else could transform and unite us at the same time? That's one of the things I was kind of reflecting on this this uh, this Sunday as well, being Easter, is, um, you know, like I said, we're, we're, we're Westerners. We're maybe a little vanilla. We don't have as much color, as much uh, emotion in some things as you, sometimes you see it in other places around the world. But how, how sanitized in a way it is when that week was so ugly, so right. gritty. It so was brutal. It was brutal. So maybe the Philippines has it right. You know, there's a certain brutality to their, yeah. you know, the way they're doing a it. A realism, yeah, like this, a, is, yeah. this is what it looked like. Yeah, where we dress little kids up in their finest clothes, yeah. and, and we don't have Easter egg hunts <clears throat> around here, but that, you know, that idea of chocolate. Yeah. And, um, you know who Tom Waits is, the singer yeah, Tom yeah. Waits? Yeah, Oh, gosh, old favorite Tom He's Waits. got a song that's worth listening to, not because it's godly, but because it's interesting. Um, it's called Chocolate Jesus. Oh, yeah. And he, he sings a song about, you know, I, I want to get me a chocolate Jesus, you know, one that's sweet and consumable. And that that's the, I mean, I'm not quoting the lyrics here. I'm just saying yeah. the, the idea is a sanitized, clean, wrapped up mm-hmm. Jesus that is for me to consume as opposed to... The real Jesus, who that week turned over tables and whipped people out of the temple, and mm. it's funny. I, I, I've often wondered, you know, how did Easter kind of arrive at being ham and eggs? You know, yeah. And I think it's about a Jewish true. Messiah figure. <laughs> yeah, and we're free. We can eat ham, ham. <laughs> and then the eggs. I mean, I, I know there's different origins of where all that came yeah. from, fertility and all this kind of stuff. But yeah, yeah. But the core of the message, right? The core of Easter. Wow, that's the core of the Christian. Uh, that's yeah. the core of the Christian faith. If there's no Easter, Paul said, "We're of all people most miserable." Mm-hmm. So yeah. if there's no resurrection. So. Yeah. Uh, last night we uh, we spoke to a, a group of young adults. They're yep. all they were all young adults yep. who are um, starting a leadership uh, cohort, cohort. Yeah. here at Church on the Hill. Great group. Yeah, um, Nicole, our our pastor of young adults, asked us to come, and she's she's doing this. She's the one leading it, but we're participating in in different parts mm-hmm. of it. And uh, so we we spent how, how long do we? I feel like we we talked hours. for a long time last night. Yeah, we were there. Yeah, we spoke for at least a couple hours. I hope we kept their attention yeah. till the end. They had a lot of great questions. Yeah, it was a good Q&A at the end. Yeah, but what do you think about that, that mm-hmm. concept of bringing together a group of people, trying to train leaders? Yeah, I think it's if we don't, we're destined for extinction. I, I think mm-hmm. um, one of the terms we use uh, here is is uh, developing a leadership pipeline, and mm-hmm. uh, for us that's uh, always looking for, identifying, and then, you know, training the next generation of leaders because mm-hmm. without the next generation again it just uh, it fades right yeah. and I think you see that in churches a lot I think you know where churches that at one time maybe 20 years ago were super strong and full mm-hmm. and healthy and then um, for some reason it's yeah. all of a sudden one day just a lot of gray hair mm-hmm. which is not a bad thing but it, it can't be the only thing uh, because somebody's got to be there yeah uh, to pick up the baton and yeah. carry it into the next you know the next decade or decades so. yeah I think you and I have been trained to always be looking for yeah that replacement that person <clears throat> you know behind you who's you know, maybe a decade behind or maybe more, but can be trained to fill your spot. Because I feel like ministry always changes as well. Our our roles have changed over the years. I'm not doing what I was doing in my 20s. Sure. And I'm not doing what I was doing in my 30s or my 40s, like each yeah. one. So each each decade needed a replacement. A, a shift or I, something, I needed, yeah. I needed to leave, and I needed someone to come in behind me yeah. into a new thing. Yeah. Uh, and we've kind of been trained around that in Youth of the Mission is where both of us got kind of, we cut our teeth in right. ministry there. We did some things before that in churches, both of us. Yeah. But I think we got our training really in Youth of the Mission and, and that concept of, hey, youth can do this was yeah. the, is the core idea that Lauren Cunningham had was that why not youth? He, he, even, yeah. he wrote a book once, Why Not Women? But, you know, why, why, not, not, youth? why not youth? Yeah. Uh, and had that picture of, of young people like... Uh, 
like waves of the ocean lapping onto the the shores of mm-hmm. unreached countries, and they're still doing it today. But we're we're still doing that as well. We're constantly looking like, hey, where is the wave behind us? That coming wave, like I've crashed on the shore, but what's coming behind me, and how do I facilitate yeah. their leadership? It's interesting. I was reading an article the other day about <clears throat> just about youth youth culture in every generation and every generation has its youth culture, right? The sixties was one thing and mm-hmm. the seventies was another eighties was another. And, but, um, there was so much criticism coming out of the roaring twenties, you know, the, the twenties were this season of decadence mm-hmm. and, uh, opulence in the big cities, a lot of, you know, the mafia yeah. and Hollywood was just really coming on strong. And so there was a, a ton of cynicism mm-hmm. about the youth of that day that they were soft and that they didn't work hard, right. that they weren't honest and blah, blah, blah. But then that generation basically fought World War II. Mm-hmm. You know, they became the generation of 20-somethings or 30-somethings that basically, yeah. uh, uh, you know, went to war for us, sacrificed greatly. So mm-hmm. the point of the article was every generation has its challenges and mm-hmm. it, maybe it's it's excess, but every generation has its potential leaders yeah. and heroes, right? Yeah. And I think that's true today. I think, you know, you you, you sort of, uh, there's always this dissection of Gen Z, Gen X, the, you know, the, and who, the characteristics of each generation. Mm-hmm. But I think every generation has a task and a call, and every generation has uh, uh, potential leaders waiting in the wings to yeah. be called up. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I think both of us are very aware of this because of our own kids too. Yeah, you know, your your kids are millennials. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess so, right? Yeah, I heard one yeah. would be a Gen Xer, I think, and then maybe, yeah, maybe. But yeah. my kids are Gen Z, right? They're the young, young ones, and uh, one's about to get married, and one's off doing training for ministry, and uh, yeah, that that idea that there are like you said, handicaps in each generation, maybe things that there's a, there's just a deficit. You know, one of the things we talked about last night is you start with, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And every youth is the, the, the deficit is, well, they just don't know yet. Yeah. And everybody starts there. Yeah. That's nothing. It's not a crime. Yeah. You can't curse someone reality. for not knowing because they, yeah. they haven't had a chance to learn yet. Um, but there's also, you know, with that, I think, uh, there's something in each generation that, is new and unique and really gifted by God, and it's still fallen until it's redeemed. Yeah. But there's something in that generation, like the um, uh, well, the Jesus Revolution movie that we've, we, I think we've talked about it here as well. That you kind of came out of that mm-hmm. as well, and that generation had something unique that was cursed by a lot, but then once redeemed, became this huge like outbreak of revival. Right. And so I'm 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 wondering like what's locked up in Gen Z. It needs to be trained yeah. and developed and redeemed. Yeah. It's going to take us places that the church has never been before. I think every generation, obviously, uh, culture continues to evolve, and culture is driven by a lot of things. You know, there's a lot of ingredients: uh, the you know, money, fame, fortune, whatever. And so, there's always going to be this fallenness on our culture. This mm-hmm. this uh, this moral dilemma in the culture. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, in our world we live in now, uh, it's magnified a thousand times because of the power of mm-hmm. media and, and influence and so forth. But uh, and, and sometimes, and I think every culture has to grapple with if you, you know that darkness or mm-hmm. that, that struggle. And, uh, but I think at the same time, God has an answer for every, for every decade or right. for every every era, for every generation, he has a call and, a, and an answer. So the '60s, I, I was in I, I was in grade school, I guess, in the '60s, uh, and again the 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 the, the sexual revolution, the mm-hmm. drug culture was all just really coming to the forefront, and w- a lot of the a lot of the the conviction was taken away, and it was yeah. to celebrate this freedom. And of course, it ran it runs its course, and mm-hmm. what's left is a lot of a lot of destruction, but it's yeah. changed. The culture becomes changed. But I think the Jesus Revolution, the '60s and the '70s, was God's answer, like to the problem or to the dilemma. And yeah. I think every generation is yeah. responsible to seek God. Like, okay, God, what's your answer mm-hmm. to this? Because we're not going to just throw up our hands and and sort of surrender to mm-hmm. the to the to the cultural mood or something. Yeah, and I don't think I'm just being. I I will say I'm, I'm speaking in faith, and, and I think it's a reality that there is something that's going to come out of this generation that is unique and and that is revival. Yeah, I, I really I really really <laughs> I believe that. Uh, Taylor will talk about that quite a bit as well, Pastor Taylor um, here at the church. 
Uh, but I, I really think there's something that's going to come out of this generation that is yeah. that is unique. So how much time? So in the conversation about ministry, sometimes we, I mean, we it's a joke in it, but it's a reality. There's 52 Sundays a year, and every every week Sunday is just a few days away, and you're preparing for that. Seems like it. That yeah yeah yeah. And so you're constantly preparing for the next Sunday. Yeah, the wheel just turns. And yeah, turns, never. Nobody ever stops the wheel and right. gives us a month off. But pastoring isn't just about preaching. Preaching on a Sunday is an important part of pastoring. It's a very important part of pastoring, but there's so much more to it. Uh, how much time like, do you think we should be giving to that, and how much time should we be giving to pastoral care? And how much time do you mm-hmm. give to the, the pipeline, the leadership pipeline that we're trying yeah. to, hey, we, we want to, to disciple a generation? Yeah, that's a great question, right? Uh, and that's probably the the big question that most pastors grapple with, mm-hmm. because you can't to do one without the other is is to undermine, I think, your future. Mm-hmm. Uh, if all I paid attention to was Sunday morning, I have to understand that Sunday morning is a unique group of people. Like mm-hmm. we say all the time, we call it Sunday morning. We call a crowd activity. In other words, everybody's mm-hmm. welcome. The bar is very low. Come in the door. We, we're glad that you're here. How can we serve you? Yeah. And then, of course, in that crowd are a whole bunch of faithful people who mm-hmm. this is their home. They have this. This is their community. They're invested here. Yeah. They're anchored here, sometimes multi-generational. But on a Sunday morning or an Easter, and this past Easter, we probably yeah. had, what, 500 people that yeah. uh, are not regular attenders. Right. And so we can't, I think as pastors, we, we want. I want to be aware of that. But I have to understand that that's only going to get a part of my time or a part mm-hmm. of my attention. And we, we talked last night about Jesus. He, Jesus taught the crowds. Mm-hmm. He sat down, yeah. fed the multitude, thousands of people at a time. You can mm-hmm. imagine feeding 5,000 people yeah. at an impromptu dinner or lunch picnic, right? Yeah. And so that must have taken a huge amount of emotional energy, mm-hmm. not to mention the physical part, right? But then at the same time, he was uh, very focused on those 12 men. And so I think that's a great model for us that it's not either or, it has to be both and mm-hmm. somehow, or because yeah. to neglect one or the other is, is, is going to hurt you eventually. Yeah. I think that one of the things I'm, I'm challenged by often, even in, the, even in the moment of preaching, is to not be led by the crowd, but yeah. to lead the crowd. Like, Seeker sensitive. Yeah. Jesus wasn't ever led by the crowd. Matter of fact, he would sometimes say things that almost like he was purposefully yeah, driving them away. offensive or something, yeah. yeah. And to just to, you know, draw a clear line to say, this is who you've come to hear. This mm-hmm. is what I am. This is yeah. who I am. This is yeah. my body. Like, like, what did you expect? Yeah. yeah. You got to eat my flesh and drink yeah. my blood. And yeah. they're like, hey, whoa, we were looking for fish yeah. and loaves, not for cannibalism. Yeah. That's, and not, a, and that's not a pitch you want to make to the consumer. Yeah. And so I, I think there's that, like, how do you... Um, I don't know how do you, how do you lead the crowd and not let the crowd lead you because I think a lot of modern church um, theory is how to draw the crowd yeah and how to keep the crowd but to draw and keep the crowd you've got to listen to the crowd and what they want yeah and then obey them yeah because that's what my because my goal is the crowd yeah and our goal isn't the crowd our goal is the glory of God that is that is our goal and so if, if the glory of God is our goal then that can happen through ministering to a large group of people, but they can't be my goal. They can't be the 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 ends. The yeah. glory of God has to be yeah. the ends. I think it was Spurgeon, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, who said, I, I want to always hold in my mind the distinction between the careless sinner and mm-hmm. the earnest seeker. Yeah. And in, in the last 20 years, the church, especially in America, I think, has been, you know, there's been huge, I don't know what word, but marketing campaigns, yeah. marketing programs mm-hmm. to reaching out to that crowd, that that seeker. Of course, we don't know, mm-hmm. right? In the pulpit, we don't know. But I definitely want to be sensitive to seekers. We'd be yeah. foolish not to be. Yeah. But I don't, like you said, want mm-hmm. the seeker to drive what we're doing, because I think we have a mandate that's pretty clear of, of what yeah. the gospel is. And yeah. and the pulpit is, is a great is a is a significant place of influence. Mm-hmm. I mean, the pulpit yeah. people come to in that it's regard. Amazing. The Sunday is always going to be for believers. Yeah, everyone's, we don't want to apologize. Everyone's for that. invited, but if you're not a believer, you're probably either you're going to have to either become a believer or leave because you're not going to be happy with us. Yeah, because everything we do is around 
our belief. This is who we are. And and it feeds those who are trying to believe. Yeah. So if you, you're welcome to come as a skeptic. I hope you come as a skeptic. But if you stay a skeptic, you're just going to, you're going to leave, I hope. You probably honestly. won't stay. Yeah, you, yeah. yeah. We talked last night about uh, the, the, con- the, the this idea, the, the consumer mindset, which is uh, the expectation of what do you have for me, mm-hmm. um, which we've been trained. Americans have been trained to mm. you know, look for the best deal, <laughs> get the rebate, yeah. customer's king, those kinds of things. And, and unfortunately, mm-hmm. I think that's played into the church world. People come and, and their question is, what's here for me? It's not a terrible question, but mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of a limited question. It's a little bit immature, I yeah. think. Uh, at some point, you've got to graduate to... What can I do for the community? Yeah. It wasn't a John Kennedy. Ask not what you can do, what your country can do for you, but what, what you, you can, can do, do for, for your country. country. And so yep. he was addressing that exact same sentiment, right? Yeah. What's in it for me? What do you got for me? And, mm-hmm. and uh, I think we again, we we again we want to we do have something for you. It may not be what you expect. Mm-hmm. It may not be what you like, but. We believe there's something super valuable about yeah. it. So the call to community, the call to commitment, the call mm-hmm. to lordship are all things that have been t- tested and tried for centuries. So in those concentric circles of crowd, committed, and core, core. The, the crowd was the ones who they'd show up in Galilee, they'd move from place yeah. to place with him, they'd yeah. chase him sometimes. The uh, committed were the 12 that he had he'd picked. He'd personally spent all night praying and picked them and... And they became the ones who were like, we're committed to you. We'll follow yeah. you anywhere. And in the core, there were these three that he seemed to pull core into his into, very yeah. inner circle and be in, in some really the very intimate times. Yeah. Is there something that you look for when doing a uh, leadership training? Is there a person you look for? Is there attributes that you look for? And someone that says, hey, this this is... There's something about this person that I I want to see them trained. I want to see them released. Yeah, into, it's a good into question. Ministry. Yeah, I think I again we've often talked about uh, we do a lot of family and marriage teaching, right? And yeah. and raising of children. And you can't help toddlers can't. It's just part of their nature to be immature mm-hmm. because they haven't they're toddlers and to be a little bit self centered mm-hmm. and self indulgent when oh, they yeah. when they're wet they want to be changed when they're hungry they want to be fed when they're not happy they want to be entertained right mm-hmm. I want my, these are my blocks mm-hmm. um, and we make tons of room for that we yeah. we don't expect a toddler to act like a fourteen year old or an mm-hmm. eighteen year old. But there is a season where that has to be let go of. Yeah. And Paul said, uh, the Apostle Paul, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I acted like a child, I spoke like a child. But when I became a man, Mm -hmm. I put away childish things. And I think that's what I look for. I think potential leaders Mm -hmm. have come to this realization this is no longer about me. And they've mm. actually made that decision. It's not just a, a cerebral exercise. Yeah. It's somebody that says, uh, I'm ready to pick up the towel mm. and serve others. To me, that's a huge leap of mm. maturity. Yeah. Uh, whereas I know lots of people that are, you know, they're, uh, they're adults, but they still haven't seemed to yeah. let go of the toddler mentality. Yeah. When they don't get their way, they... They make a fuss, and mm-hmm. they they storm off, they they pout, you know, and I think that's the tragedy. I think of yeah. uh, of, of uh, I, you're reminding me of maybe the flip side of this is unfortunately I think everyone has met someone in ministry who it's their career, but they're still it's about them. It it's. It's about the position. It's about the. Yeah. It's about the attention. Yeah. It's about those the things. Ego. Yeah. Yeah. The ego, and everyone has an ego. Sure. I, I have an ego. Mm-hmm. You have an ego. Every time you know people pay attention to you as a leader, there's this. Oh no! Like this could take over. I could feel this. Like yeah. that feels a little good. People are listening yeah, yeah. to me, and so I'm not saying you have to be completely empty of that, but it's something you have to be aware of, and you have to you have to purposefully say no, no, that's childish. I'm here to serve, not to be served. Um, I think maybe what you're describing too made me think of like someone who wants it. Yeah, they want it. You yeah, know, they see like, oh, I'm here, and that's over there, and I want to get there. Yeah. So can you help me get to that? Like, can you help yeah. me get to that thing? 
and they submit to that idea. Like, I'm willing to do some things I don't want to do in order to get to this place of leadership. If, <laughs> yeah. you'll, if you'll help me get there, yeah. then I'll stop with this childish yeah. stuff to do some adult stuff. That's a powerful shift, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a... I think we underestimate the incredible power of that yeah. mental shift of one day when I I, I make a decision, of, or, or maybe it's a realization at first, like, okay, mm-hmm. I, I I have to grow up now. Sometimes yeah. circumstances, like back to the back to the World War II example mm-hmm. of a whole generation had to grow up really quick because they yeah. were thrown into a life and death situation. Mm-hmm. So the little things yeah. uh, that that tend to occupy our time or our attention or our lives were all of a sudden pushed to the side. Mm-hmm. Comfort. Uh, buying a car, playing yeah. the football game, all that was pushed to the side for a greater cause of a world war that mm. needed to be fought. And I think a, a young person who wakes up one day to the, the world war of the Great Commission, that mm-hmm. hey, this world is at war. There's a, a God who loves us and there's an enemy who hates and wants yeah. to kill and destroy. That's a huge wake-up call mm-hmm. to, oh my gosh, I have to say no to my childhood or my childish ways, like, yeah. like Paul said, right? Well, look at the Gospels, too, and you see uh, 12 guys who said yes yeah. to a call. They were called, and then they said yes. And for the most part, you know, it, they didn't come ask Jesus, can I follow you? But Jesus tapped them on the shoulder and said, yeah. follow me, and they said yes. But they didn't really know what they were getting into no, either. I don't think they had any they, idea. Yeah. And there was hints along the way that... That made them pause and go, "Oh, there's more to this than I thought this is there bigger was." Than or I I'd hoped you were going to do this, but you're you're refusing to do what I wanted you to do. And am I going to continue to say yes to this guy who called me, the one who's yeah. talking about being crucified and who turns crowds away when I'm really interested in the crowd? Like, yeah. this is crazy. Why would we turn these people away? This is our power base. This is how we're going to take Jerusalem. You know, all of these things. And they continue to say yes. Uh, might be one of the most crucial things about any of them. Yeah. Because the, the Scripture says, Acts 4.13, that they were unlearned and ignorant men. Yeah. It described them as unlearned and ignorant men. Yeah. So he didn't pick from the, probably the... Like the, the most, pedigree, the cream of the crop. Maybe the most prestigious on one hand person they picked could have been the tax collector. Mm-hmm. And even then he was despised, but he did have a public job and <laughs> yeah, maybe he had some power you know, there. So he he picked guys who were not your average picks, you know. But there had to have been a kernel of uh, in their lives. I, I mean, I, sometimes I think we read the scripture, read the gospels through our Western eyes, but through right. the eyes of those Jewish men, they had had hundreds of years of prophecies, seeds yeah. of prophecy planted that said, there's a Messiah coming, I'm going to mm-hmm. send the Messiah. You know, the book of Malachi, the Old Testament closes with this, He's coming. He's going to turn the hearts of yeah. the children back to the yes. fathers. So mm-hmm. that had been passed down, passed down. So when Jesus appeared on the scene, I'm sure after 400 years of silence, mm. the, the the kernel was still there, but how that was going to play out might yeah. have been an entirely different... I mean, did it have... Uh, it must have had political overtones. It must have had religious mm. overtones. And and then this Jesus is just different than anything yeah. they, they had expected or could have imagined, you know? Robert E. Coleman wrote this book... Um... The Master Plan, Master of, Evangelism. Plan of Evangelism, yeah. Master Plan of Evangelism, uh, which is a, a great book. Um, not the best written book, but it's a, a, still a great book. It's barely bigger than a pamphlet, so it's worth reading. But he says this about the disciples. He says, though often mistaken in their judgment and slow to comprehend spiritual things, they were honest men willing to confess their need, and they were teachable. Yeah, yeah. So, Boy. Because he corrected them all the time. You see in Scripture these corrections, corrections, and they didn't walk away. And there yeah. was something. Now, obviously, we know that uh, yeah. Judas betrayed him, so something was happening inside of him that wasn't mm-hmm. happening in the others. But 11 of them just continued to go, okay, I still don't get it, but I see something in you that I won't yeah. walk away from. Yeah. Even this coming Sunday, this, this last uh, little bit, uh, we're going to... I'm not sure when this is going to air, but this Sunday is just this idea of the reinstatement of Peter after the denial, and he meets his up with his friends on the on the shore there, mm-hmm. and and he recommissions them, you know, yeah. to go and feed the sheep. And I think uh, I, I think that's just the most amazing thing that God of mm-hmm. the universe has invested in His creation 
with a plan of redemption, you know, mm-hmm. to redeem the broken story, yeah. to redeem broken humanity. That's why I continue to do, that's why I've been mm-hmm. in ministry for 40 years. I so believe, and I've, we've witnessed, I think, right, mm-hmm. the power of personal, tra- the gospel to transform someone at a very personal level, and then how it dominoes into families or communities or yeah. wherever that person goes. And I mean, yeah. what other... What other uh, what other answer is there mm-hmm. for the uh, for broken humanity? And in a short amount of time, those few men and women who were just the men and women who yeah. wanted to be used and were willing to, in a, in a lifetime, just in their lifetime, they saw huge change. And within a couple lifetimes, you saw Christianity take over yeah. so much the known world in a in a significant way. Now then, there was issues with. Integration in Rome and all of this, but the gospel had been spread significantly by such a small amount of people. Uh, Isn't it amazing that if it was just a philosophy or if mm -hmm. it was just uh, limited to that time, it it would Mm -hmm. it would have to have faded? You know, entropy would take over; it would just wind down. Mm -hmm. But it continues to be this living sort of truth, uh, where. People who touch it, people who engage in it, it, the power is still there to transform yeah. a human life. I mean, again, it's just, it's, it's astounding when you really think about it. So you asked a great question last night that maybe would be worth talking here before we, we finish. Um, is uh, you threw out the idea, like, what's more important, the giftings and the talent Right or mm-hmm. the character is that yeah. the word? Yeah, using? character and, and and competency is the way I put it. Yeah, character and competency. Yeah. So, uh, what if you were low in competency but high in character, or the opposite? You were high in competency but low in character. Which would make the better yeah. minister? That's a great discussion, and it's, I think mm-hmm. it's fascinating because it's that the question you just asked is always relative and pertinent. Yeah. Whether you're talking about I'm thinking of getting married to this person or yeah. I'm thinking of taking a job or a position or I'm going to start something, mm-hmm. that competency, when I, use, when I use that word, what I mean is our skill set, our abilities, our giftings, mm-hmm. you know, uh, yeah. I'm good at, I'm an accountant, I'm a carpenter, I'm a, mm-hmm. I'm a lawyer, I'm a judge, the ability to exercise that gift. Mm-hmm. And it makes the world a better place, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, the, the competency for good yeah. and what that brings. But on the other side of that is character. And I think we have all seen, we could talk for an, another hour about mm-hmm. the examples of people who had incredible competency, right. but there was a lack of character in the hidden life, mm-hmm. the unseen areas of their lives that yeah. undermined. And so I, I liken it to a building, you know, uh, if you're going to build a one-story building, you need a a relatively short foundation, right. but you need a foundation. Mm-hmm. But if your building's going to be 30 or 40 or 50 stories tall... You got to go bedrock. You better go deeper. Yeah. And so competency is my above ground life. It's mm-hmm. what I'm good at, what people see, what they affirm me for, what they pay me for, what mm-hmm. gets me on you know, the TED Talks or, right. or whatever. But behind the scenes... Yeah. And, and again, we don't have to look very far to see pastors, mm-hmm. Christian ministers... The Bernie Madoffs and others who have gotten to this pinnacle of competency, yeah. and they crash and burn. You know, it's it's fascinating because it's so important. Because uh, there, well, I would say, if you're going to be in ministry, there are some competencies you have to have. Sure, yeah, you you just have to, yeah. And like if anything you, else, and we're really really big on team around here. So if you don't have that competence, that Personal, then you need to staff it. You need to bring someone into the team yeah. that has that that skill. Communication. Because I can't possibly be good at everything. No, no one, no is. one is. Yeah. yeah. You've got to be good at communication. I mean, it's really important that you're a good communicator, you, especially if you're, you know, if you're in ministry, there's going to be a teaching yeah. element. Preaching or teaching, yeah. yeah. Uh, that interpersonal skills of caring for people, being a competent to understand someone's emotions yeah. and minister to those emotions. Yeah. And then just the leadership to make the decisions, those are all really, really important. But we're all lacking in, in each of them. Um, I, we didn't talk about this last night, but I was thinking about it, and I didn't want to take us off track. But um, I, I had a... I want to be careful how I say this, because I hope it doesn't sound prideful, but there was reality that I had character as a young man. Mm-hmm. I had some character in mm-hmm. me. God had done some things, I'd been saved, I'd been redeemed, and, the, and character existed in me. And 
in in the ministry I was in that kept getting recognized and like promoted. Right. Hey, hey, we can trust you. Do this. We can trust you. Do this. We can trust you. Do this. But I didn't have competency. I was just too young. Yeah. I was still in the I right. don't know what I don't know phase. Right. And I really yeah. needed someone to come alongside me and say, "Hey, it's great that you're not stealing any of the money or or you know, <laughs> you're right. The, your your character's holding up, but you really got to learn how to talk, man. <laughs> yeah. Or you you know, it wasn't a character issue, but you didn't even notice this hurting person that needed to be ministered to. And so I I realized I had to pull out of some of my leadership and say, "Hey, I appreciate that you guys have put me here, but I shouldn't be here. I I need to back up yeah. and go get some skills <laughs> and some competency before I can go forward again." Yeah. And so both of them, you know, can be a hindrance to lack. Yeah. We're not just saying like, "Yeah, you don't have any competency, just have character." Because you do have to have competency. Yeah. You it's, do. It's not the way life works. I mean, I think yeah. we all have had situations. There's a, there's a, a a story I tell to make it maybe illustrated a little bit. If I was if my boat had sunk in, in uh, uh, two hundred miles offshore mm-hmm. and I needed to be rescued or I was going to drown, mm-hmm. I would be very interested in a Coast Guard helicopter. Come mm-hmm. and pluck me out of the ocean. Yeah. So I'm in there. I'm I'm floating in the ocean. My uh, my family's gonna die. And all of a sudden, this Coast Guard helicopter appears, mm-hmm. and a guy 100 feet above me with a helmet looks out and drops a rope and says, "Grab that rope." Mm-hmm. Well, that's a scary endeavor. But what do I? What am I doing right now? I am trusting the competency yeah. of that that operator. Mm-hmm. That this guy knows how to fly the helicopter. He's gonna pull right. me up on that cable, and mm-hmm. we're all gonna be saved. So, yeah, it, I don't. Frankly, I don't yeah. care if that guy. I don't care about his personal habits. Mm-hmm. I don't care about the way he does his finances or his yeah. sexuality or his religion or lack of it. Right. All I want to know is, are you competent to save my life? Yeah. But it, when I get into that helicopter and he takes me to the shore and we strike up a conversation and he mm-hmm. starts asking me about my teenage daughter, well, now it's not a competency conversation. Yeah. It's a character conversation. Yeah. I want to know this about yeah. you. And I, I don't think it's either or, it's it's both and. Yeah. and, and I if think... my pipes freeze and burst and the first van that comes has a big Jesus loves you <laughs> fish on it, and I'm like, oh, praise God, I get to work with a Christian. But then they come Hopefully. in and they open their toolbox and there's only a hammer in there. Yeah. And I'll be like, hey, I'm glad you love Jesus, but, but... Pack, pack up your yeah. tool, yeah. your one hammer and go yeah. home. Yeah. I, I need someone who knows how to fix yeah. this. Yeah. And so the, the, that's such a great conversation. The $10,000 yeah. question last night was if you had to choose one or the other, yeah. which would you choose? Mm-hmm. Which, And of course, I think it's always going to yeah. be, a, well, I don't want to live without character because with with, with someone with character, mm-hmm. we're less likely to have a train wreck. We're less likely yeah. to suffer. Yeah. Yeah. The the uh, We can talk about it in terms of tragedy. You know, the tragedy in the plumbing plumber scenario is, you know, if I get someone with great character but no skills is, well, I can fix this. Like yeah. it was a it was a plumbing tragedy. Yeah, yeah. But if I get someone who comes in with great skills and no character and they chase after my, my young daughter, right. yeah. that's a bigger tragedy. Yeah, they undermine that's everything. A, yeah. yeah. And and the the pain that we have seen in ministry over the years is to, at times. The bigger tragedy wasn't that someone couldn't figure out the money. And they made a mistake because we can we can forgive and get over that. It's that someone stole, stole the, the money. money and ruined the reputation. Yeah, because now, like in the first scenario, oh, you just you made a money mistake. There is grace for this. We love you. We'll figure this out. In the second one, you've tarnished the 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 name of Jesus. Yeah, like th- this is a serious, more much more serious, and your problem. own family, your own name. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe we've gone far enough here. We, we've talked for a while. Yeah. But, uh, I, I think m- more recently than ever before, maybe it's because of you know my own age of entering the, the 50s, still in the what? early side of the 50s, but I, I'm thinking like, oh, yeah, I, I need young men and women who are ready to lay down their lives. Yeah. Like, I was a young guy who was ready to lay down my life. I'd follow a leader who knew where he was going and understood the Word of God. I, I was willing to do that. You know, my 20s, I'm like, I was looking for those mm-hmm. men and women who who knew what God was saying, and I gave a good portion of my life to their vision. Yeah. And then at a certain point, God starts to put in you your own vision, and you're like, okay, now I need a team. I need some young men and yeah. women who are willing to, to jump on board and go wherever God is saying. Yeah. yeah. 
It's a great time to be preaching the gospel. It is. It is a great time to be preaching the gospel. So, yeah. Well, folks, um, yeah, we love you. I'm glad. Uh, hope some of you maybe uh, hung out that, how, hung out with us on Easter for the first time. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you found our podcast yet or not, but uh, we hope you uh, come stick around. Mention the new series us. real quick before we go. That's we're right. We're starting a new series next week. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's right. Next week we're starting a new series called "A New Way to Be Human," yeah. which is uh, kind of a fun title. And I'm curious if anyone could guess where that would be. I don't know if you'd be able to or not. Um, take a guess. I'll give you one second. Take a guess what uh, what book of the Bible we're going to use for that. Ooh, good one. Now I'll tell you, it's going to be Ephesians. We're going to be looking at Ephesians, yeah. which is a very practical book. I think a lot of times people look at it and think spiritual warfare. Yeah. They boil it down to the armor of God, and those are both true and in there. But there's it's also just an incredibly practical book about how to live post-resurrection, which is a great time after Easter to be talking about yeah. that. Yep. See you there. Yeah. Let us know if we can help you. If yep. this is helpful, pass it along to somebody. Yeah. Bless you guys. Bye. Yeah.